This video is going to be looking at the inorganic chemistry topic of acids, alkalis and titrations, specifically looking at the triple content, so focusing on the titration part, and this is for the Edexcel IGCSE chemistry course. So the one learning outcome that we have to cover here is how we carry out an acid alkali titration. I will not go into the details about calculations for titrations, that will be covered in a different video that you'll be able to find on the YouTube channel. So what is a titration? Well, first of all, a titration is an analytical method that we use to follow the course of a neutralization reaction, and it is the reaction between an acid and an alkali. And the most important thing that they do is they are used to determine the exact volume of an acid or an alkali that is required to neutralize a specific volume of an acid or alkali. So for example, if we have 25 centimeters cubed of HCl, we can use a titration to determine how much sodium hydroxide we're going to need in order to calculate sorry, in order to fully neutralize this hydrochloric acid. The other thing that we have to know is we have to know the concentration of the two substances, because depending on your concentration will depend on what volume you're going to be using. So how do we actually do the titration? Well, we measure out our acid, typically it'd be hydrochloric or sulfuric or nitric, and we use a pipette and a pipette filler. So a pipette, you can see, is this piece of equipment here. It is a glass tube with a bulb in the center, and it is a very accurate way in order to measure out 25 centimeters cubed. And what you do is you use a pipette filler, which uses a suction method in order to take up the liquid through the pipette, and there will be a graduated mark like that and it will be a straight line and you want your curve of your liquid to sit directly on the line and that curve is called the meniscus. So the liquid have a curve to it once it is in the tube and then you want that bottom of that curve sitting right on the line to tell you that it is 25 centimeters cubed. We then put that into a conical flask and typically we'll add an indicator as well. So you might use phenolphthalein, methyl orange. We don't tend to use universal indicator here because it gets too vague of a change in color. We want something that is a nice easy color. So typically the one that you will use will be phenolphthalein because we get color changes from colorless to pink or vice versa. So what we then do is we fill the burette with our sodium hydroxide solution. So the burette is, as you can see, a tall, thin glass tube that has got a tap at the bottom. And this is then used to measure out how much sodium hydroxide is required to neutralize this 25 centimeters cubed. So we take the initial reading, and this would usually be zero centimeters cubed, but not always and we record it to two decimal places. We carry out the titration by opening the tap, allowing the sodium hydroxide to flow through, and then we get a, a specific value. So you can see here, we've put our drops of phenolphthalein indicator, and we then add the sodium hydroxide until the indicator changes color. In this case, we are going from colorless to pink. And once we get this permanent pale pink color then we take the reading on the burette and what will happen is you will have a specific volume of sodium hydroxide that has been added and this is the key piece of information that you're trying to find out you, you then use that volume in a titration calculation But as I said, I'm not going to go through how to carry these out in this video. This will be in the calculations topic. For now, it's just how we actually carry it out. So we do require an indicator and an acid-base titration, as the majority of our acids and bases are colourless. So we can't determine our end point. Our end point is when we have 
completed the neutralization reaction. So it's to tell us that we are at pH 7. So the most common indicators are methyl orange and phenolphthalein, and you will have covered these in the double content. So if you can't remember, go back and have a look at either the textbook or watch the video. Methyl orange, remember, and an acid is red and an and alkali is yellow. And phenolphthalein is, as we said a few times now, colourless to pink. So just to run through the clear steps of the method about how we do this. So we rinse the pipette and the flask with some hydrochloric acid. We do not use water because that will dilute our sample and we need a very specific concentration. We then use the pipette to measure out 25 centimetres cubed of the hydrochloric acid and it goes into our conical flask. And remember, we use a pipette filler to do this. You will carry out this experiment in, in class and you will be able to actually see how you do this and you will come back to titrations as you get through A-level chemistry as well. So once we've got our hydrochloric acid in our conical flask, we then add our phenolphthalein indicator. I fill up my burette with my sodium hydroxide and I record the starting volume. It does not have to be zero, but most people will fill the burette up to zero and just start from there. We add the sodium hydroxide until we get that colour change. Remember, it should be a permanent pink colour. That's how you know you're at your end point. And then you record the volume. You repeat this process. So after you've emptied the conical flask and rinse it, you repeat it until you get something called concordant results. And concordant results means that they are within 0.2 centimetres cubed of each other. Now, when we're carrying out titrations, the very first titration that you do is known as a rough titration and this is exactly what it sounds like it is a rough guide about how much alkali we need to neutralize the acid so when we do this process we are not being 100 percent accurate in the first instance if we said for example that we needed 20 centimeters cubed of the naoh what we would then do in our second titration is we would quickly add about 17 to 18 centimetres cubed. And we don't have to look at the conical flask at this point because we know we shouldn't be at the end point. Once you've added 18, then you add the remaining volume dropwise. And that means drop by drop. So you turn the tap just enough to let one drop of the alkali come out and fall into the flask. You shake the flask and you wait to see if there's a colour change. This is because that one drop of alkali could be the thing that causes the indicator to change colour. So it's very important that we do it dropwise because it gives us an accurate volume. So when we're reading the volume from the burette, we must read from the bottom of the meniscus. And this is what we mentioned when we were talking about the pipette. So the meniscus is this curve of the liquid here. Okay, we never read from the top of the curve. It is always from the bottom of the curve of the liquid. And you'll be able to see this very clearly when you do fill the burette. So when we look at this particular um, burette value, you can see that there are three possible ways to read it, but only one of them is correct. If you look up you're, and read from the top, you're going to get a value of 19.82. If you look down and you read to the bottom, you're going to get 19.62, but neither of these are correct. You need to look straight at eye level and you need to read from the bottom of the meniscus or the bottom of the curve and you will get a value of 19.70 centimeters cubed. So the volume that you have used in your titration or your titer volume can be calculated by subtracting the initial volume from the final volume. So if you started at uh, an initial reading of 2.10 and you ended at 
23.85, we do 23.85, take away 2.10, and we get a tighter volume of 21.75. And we would do this, as we said, multiple times until we get concordant values. And we'll touch on the calculation later. Now, these two links are very useful to actually show you how to carry out an acid-base titration. You can find the links in the description below, so please make sure to check these out. Let's now look at a past paper question. So a student carries out the titration to find the concentration of some dilute sulfuric acid. She's given the sulfuric acid, some sodium hydroxide of a specific concentration, the suitable apparatus, and a phenolphthalene indicator. So the method that she uses is this time she puts the sodium hydroxide into the conical flask. As I said, it doesn't matter whether it is the acid or the base, just as long as you make sure that you don't mix them beforehand. She then adds the phenolphthalein indicator and then fills the burette with sulfuric acid and adds the sulfuric acid until the phenolphthalein indicator changes colour. So the first part is name the piece of apparatus that the student should use to add to the sodium hydroxide in step one. Now, under no circumstances can we ever use a beaker because it is not accurate enough. And because this titration is all about accuracy, we cannot use a measuring cylinder either. There's only one correct answer, and that is a pipette. Then we want to look at the colour change from the phenolphthalein to the um, the product at, in step four. Now notice that this time we started with the base and then we went to the neutral substance. So this is different to the example that we just looked at a minute ago. This time the base is going to already be a pink colour because phenolphthalein is pink when it is in an alkali. So in this case we're going to be going from pink to colourless. So the answer is B. And part C, why is it better to use phenolphthalein indicator rather than universal indicator? Um, and it is because phenolphthalein only has two colours. Universal indicator gives us a very wide range of colours and what you may see as green may be yellow or dark green to someone else, so it's too subjective. Whereas phenolphthalein is either colourless or it is pink, so it is less or even not subjective. So the diagram shows the burette readings in one titration and it's asking us to use the readings to complete the table. So the burette reading after adding the acid, where we go, we can see that the scale is going downwards this time. So we're going from 23 to 24 and it is sitting in the centre here. So our answer should be for after 24.15 centimetres cubed because it is sitting in between 21.4 and 21, sorry, 24.1 and 24.2. Then we look at where it was before the acid. It is sitting bang on this line. So our answer is going to be 2.30. Notice that everywhere I have two decimal places because it asks for the nearest 0.05. If you do not have two decimal places, you will lose a mark here. And then in order to calculate the actual value, we do this number, take away that number, and then it gives us a value of 21.85 centimetres cubed. The student then repeats the experiment using the same sodium hydroxide but another solution of sulfuric acid of a different concentration and we've got a table of results here. The one that we are interested in is this volume of acid here. These are our tighter volumes and we want to determine which ones we are going to use in our calculation or which ones we can find the average of. Now as I said we never ever use the first column this is always the rough titration, so we completely ignore that. So now we're looking at 
26.75 and 26.40. And we are looking for which ones are concordant results. And the question even tells us that concordant results should be within 0 0.2 of each other. So we should have ticks in column 2 and column 4. Then we want to use this, these ticked results in order to calculate the average volume. Well, this is as simple as 26.30 plus 26.40 divided by 2 gives 26.35 centimetres cubed. And that is your final answer. Notice again, it must be to two decimal places because every other value is to two decimal places. There you can check your answers if you've been working on these questions yourself. That's everything for the actual theory of how to of how to carry out titrations. If you want to know more about how to do the calculations, please make sure to check back on the YouTube channel for that video. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below and I hope to see you back on the channel soon.